It is day 5 of your internship and it's about 3 p.m. and you're ready to get set up to go home. However, your senior resident calls you up and presents a case to you. And the case goes like this. A 70 year old male with a past medical history of hypertension, DM, coronary artery disease, status post 2 stents was brought in by EMS after being found by the daughter to have a slurred speech and drooping of his face upon waking up. The patient was last seen to be normal at 9 pm the night before. The patient is brought to the ED and by the ED physician's assessment, the patient does not seem to have any form of neurologic deficit. They call you and they give you this admission. The current time is 9 a.m. The patient did have some form of neurologic deficit. He had slurred speech. He also had a facial droop that was noticed by the doctor. But the patient's here now and the ED physician tells you that the patient does not have any neurologic deficit. By definition, what is this? What are you going to call this? This is what we call a transient ischemic attack. It is not a stroke, but rather a premature stroke, which is called a transient ischemic attack, which means the patient had some form of neurologic deficit, which is now gone. It was present. It's now gone. It's not an infarct, but rather ischemia. There was some amount of transient decreased blood flow to the brain, which caused the neurologic symptom, which is now gone. So you're going to call it transient ischemic attack. Now, back Back in the day, we used to have a definition from transient ischemic attack, which said the patient's symptoms should be reversible and it should last that less than 24 hours. This has been taken off of the definition and it does not exist any longer. If a patient comes with symptoms, neurologic disturbances that is gone right now and you do an imaging study which does not show any evidence of a stroke, you will call it a TIA. Let's dive right into the physical examination. So the vital signs that this patient has is a hundred 160 over 90 blood pressure, heart rate of 84, respiratory rate of 16 and a temperature of 99 degree Fahrenheit. Now if you look at the patient in the general appearance, the guy looks completely fine. He looks normal. On neurologic examination, his facial nerves are intact. There's no cranial nerve deficit. His muscle tone power in all his extremities are completely normal. And he's talking to you in a very fluent pattern. There is no aphasia uh, and none, none, no neurologic deficit is present. All right, cardiovascular S1, S2 heard, no rubs, gallops or murmurs, which is also normal. Respiratory system is also normal, normal, beautiful uh, bilateral breath sounds are heard, no wheezes, no crackles, nothing's present. And lastly, lower extremities is also normal. There's no pitting penile edema and there is no evidence of any form of uh, DVT either. All right, so you have a physical examination that's completely normal. So this is again telling you that this patient most likely has a transient S ischemic attack all right does this guy have risk factors sure he does he's got the age he's got diabetes he's got hypertension he's got coronary artery disease with two stents in the past he has risk factors he had neurologic deficit but now he doesn't have any deficit this means he had a TIA does this mean you can just discharge the patient from the ER and tell him to follow up as outpatient or do you still want to work this guy up because he most likely has a high risk for developing a stroke right so again now let's move into our labs and orders and let's keep this patient at least for 24 hours and get some workup done because he is at high risk for strokes all right guys since we are in the subject of TIA I need to tell you guys about one important scoring system that we do use uh, not often used in the hospital setting but rather used in the primary care setting this is known as your ABCD squared score A stands for age which is greater than 60 gets one point B is for blood pressure if the patient has a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90 gets one point C is for clinical symptoms if the patient had a unilateral weakness that patient gets two points if the patient has just isolated speech disturbance then the patient will get one point and all other symptoms will get zero points D stands for two things duration of symptoms and diabetes mellitus duration of symptoms if the patient has symptoms more than 60 minutes gets two points if it is 10 to 59 minutes it's one point and if it is less than 10 minutes then we'll get zero points diabetes it's simple if the patient has diabetes gets one point if no diabetes zero points now ABCD squared score is often used in a primary care setting when the patient comes with these symptoms the real question this tells you is what is the risk that this patient is at of developing an actual stroke within the next one week so if you have a score of zero to three this is low risk 
4 to 5 is moderate risk, whereas 6 to 7 is high risk. The real utility of this ABCD squared score is in the primary care to determine if you really want to send this patient to the hospital or not. In hospital setting, you really don't need to use it, but I still wanted you guys to learn it because we are in the subject of TIA. So recall and remember your ABCD squared score in the context of TIA. Let's go on to labs and orders. Let's place our basic labs that you must place in this patient. You can get a CBC on this patient, you can get a CMP, a complete metabolic panel, you want to get a lipid panel on this patient as you know that increased lipids actually predisposes the patient to get atherosclerosis and so it can cause MIs as well as strokes right PTT PT iron are not really necessary but you can always get a baseline if you want to especially if you're suspecting it number five is gonna be EKG as you guys already know if a patient is having a stroke you must make sure if the patient has any form of abnormal heart rhythm such as atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter all right there's more to the more unique tests that are often done in in patients with a uh, stroke slash TIA so this patient the TIA you still need to get a CT head the guy is coming with neurologic deficit which is now gone but you must get a CT head initially or you could get an MRI head whichever one you can get done faster because the absence of an infarct in the brain is by definition TIA all right neurologic symptoms that's gone and there's no evidence of an infarct on imaging study so CT head or an MRI brain must be done okay once those two tests are done again are you going to get a CT angio head and neck or an MRA head and neck yes you must get these studies done too reason is if the patient is having a symptom such as TIA essentially most of the time what happens is there's occlusion of a lot of your uh, extra cranial internal carotid arteries or some internal carotid uh, artery stenosis within the, within the uh, cranium itself so you must get a CT angiography or an MRA how are you going to decide which one you're going to do remember CT angiography you will use contrast so if you're using contrast you want to kind of avoid this test in a patient who has a chronic kidney disease because it can cause contrast induced nephropathy and worsening kidney function now if you look at an MRA you do not use contrast and therefore this will become a very good choice in a patient with a chronic kidney disease but MRA also has its own problem if your patient has some form of pacemaker or a metallic device uh, or some form of metallic prosthesis in their body then you cannot do an MRA in those patients you can most likely go ahead and do a CTA head and neck essentially the goal you, you doing this test is to see if there is any form of extra cranial internal carotid artery stenosis or is there some form of large vessel atherosclerosis in your brain because if these things are present there are actual treatments the treatments that are available are in fact you can do a carotid endarterectomy or you could do a stent placement and if you put a stent placement especially is an important point you must know if a stent is placed you must have these patients on dual antiplatelet therapy very good if you also have a large vessel atherosclerosis even these patients you will put them on dual antiplatelet therapy we'll talk about these kind of facts uh, in in a different section which is going to be solely on uh, the subject proper of strokes however because it's a clinical vignette we're dealing with here let's keep moving on all right so you can do a CTA head and neck or an MRA head and neck essentially the reason you're doing it is to see if there's a large vessel occlusion or not all right the echo with bubble study again you're doing an echo with bubble study to see if there is a patent for an oval or an AST because if there is an opening in your septum you know this is your source for paradoxical emboli anytime you have an echo with bubble that's positive make sure if the patient does have a stroke you must get a venous duplex of the lower extremities to rule out the presence of a DVT and if there's a DVT then you will treat the DVT with anticoagulation appropriately however echo with bubble study is a necessity then a whole to monitor whole to monitor if the patient's EKG is normal and the EKG does not show any abnormal rhythm now in this patient you can actually Actually get a 24 hour hold to monitor because you might be still dealing with a case of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter all right and as I already mentioned venous duplex and lastly carotid duplex if you do a CTA or a MRA of a head and neck you do not have to do carotid duplex all right this basically concludes the labs and orders that you're gonna place in your patient with a TIA all right guys so let's move on to the final component of your case of TIA which is your assessment and plan now unlike the previous episode
episodes where you gave TPA versus a patient with an actual acute ischemic stroke, management here essentially focuses on prevention of the next stroke. All right, so it's not really uh, acute management that you're going to do in a patient with TIA because clearly the patient does not have any symptoms at this point of time. All right, so let's move on here. So important things that you're going to do is a patient with TIA, you must make sure the patient is on aspirin. All right, the patient needs to be on aspirin. If it's not on aspirin, you're going to start the patient on aspirin. Apart from that, you're also going to start the patient on a statin. And to start the statin, you're going to follow the ASCVD score. To know what the ASCVD score is, watch our videos on the ASCVD score. All right, so aspirin and an atovastatin you're going to do. And apart from that, essentially, as I said, you're going to manage the risk factors. Whatever predisposes the patient to getting a stroke or a TIA is what needs to be managed. If the patient is hypertensive, make sure you optimize the patient's blood pressure medications. The patient is diabetic, make sure the patient is optimized on his diabetes uh, management. Also get a hemoglobin A1C and make sure it is up to target. Number three, carotid stenosis. Now when you do a CT angiography or an MRA, you see that the patient's got carotid stenosis. So you'll follow the certain guidelines that present for the management of carotid stenosis. And you can do either carotid endarterectomy or a stent could be put in. Either way, if there is a carotid stenosis, you are gonna manage it appropriately. Number four, atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. Maybe it's present on EKG, maybe it's present on the Holter monitor. Either way, it doesn't matter. You will follow the CHADS2 VAS score and you will start the patient on either antiplatelet agent or anticoagulation. Finally, you have the PFO. If on the echo with bubble study shows the patient has a patent for arm and ovale, the question is, are you gonna close it or not? In the context of TIA, you really don't close the PFO. However, if a patient has had recurrent cryptogenic strokes, which means the patient is uh, having multiple strokes and the age is less than 60 and there's no risk factors at all nowadays there are certain studies that is actually showing that there's proven benefit in actually closure of the PFO however closure of the PFO increases the incidence of atrial fibrillation therefore it does come at a cost so again closure of PFO is a very controversial subject at least for now we should get some closure on the closure of PFO soon enough all right guys so this concludes your assessment and plan so management of TIA really isn't a hospital admission per se. You can always put a patient in an observation status and monitor the patient for 24 to 48 hours and get all this test done and then make sure the patient has an outpatient follow-up. So now your goal really is to prevent this patient from actually developing the next stroke or actually getting a stroke in the future. All right guys, so this completes our session on TIA. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please subscribe, hit the like button and also hit the bell button for further notifications of the upcoming videos. I'll see you guys on the next video. Until then, goodbye from me.